Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pray First, a conversation we have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. Hashtag live, you're joining us live, hashtag recorded. If you're joining recorded, that is at any other time than this morning. This is Thursday morning, March 25th, 2021. Hashtag shared, if you will put this out on your page, it is so good to be with all of you guys on this day. If you're in the Mid-South, be careful outside if you're driving. It's a little crazy around the Memphis, Tennessee area. And it's going to be a little crazy all day, I think, weather-wise. Hit the hearts, hit the lights, go crazy on those, and let our first-time guests know that you are glad that they are here. If you're from around the world, let us know where you're from. Hashtag where you're from. Hashtag uh, Kenya. Hashtag Uganda. Hashtag Tanzania. Hashtag all those places that you join us from and let us know that you're uh, here with us uh, because it is a... It is a great privilege to have all of you guys right here on the Pray First channel. Hi, Patty. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, June. Hi, everybody. You see those hearts and those thumbs? Hit those things. Go nuts on those. They're right down there in the corner. You hit those and let everybody know that we're glad they're here. So if you see a bouquet of hearts and thumbs going up, that is for you, our first-time guest. Maybe you saw it in your news feed. Maybe a friend invited you to Pray First. But we're in the middle of something pretty exciting here at Pray First. Uh, Normally, I teach each morning and uh, we talk about different subjects and topics and things going on in the Bible, principles found in the Bible. Now we are reading the entire Bible together, uh, so it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Hi, June. Good morning, June. It's good to see you. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Corrine. Hashtag live, hashtag record, hashtag shared. Also, I'm about to go ahead and post out there and show you uh, a link, I believe, if it's not already on there, on your page. Pray First YouTube. I hope that is popped up there. It's a brand new thing that uh, we were able to do. It says to show it, and I keep pushing it, so I don't know if that works or not. You can let me know if it's on there. Today, we are coming back into the Gospels. We've already read the book of Matthew. We've read the book of Mark. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector that Jesus said, come follow me. Mark was a friend and companion of uh, the apostle Uh, Paul and went on missionary journeys with him. Probably he was a cousin to Barnabas. And then we went back to the Proverbs and read a lot of things by Lemuel and by Solomon and Proverbs that were collected by Solomon. You guys have now finished three books. Today, we're coming to my personal favorite gospel. I'm excited to tell you some things about it. So tag your friends and share this out because what I'm about to tell you is about the man who wrote uh, the book of... uh, Luke, he was a physician. He was a trained uh, and skilled doctor. We know this. Um, Even, you know, he claims he's a physician. Paul refers to uh, Luke as a doctor in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. And also, throughout Luke's writings, he uses precise medical terms to describe the people's uh, physical afflictions. Luke gives us the most detailed account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Luke, the man, was not an original disciple of Jesus. Uh, He knew uh, the original disciples. He was friends. Uh, He traveled with Paul as well. He had access to John. Uh, We know that the Luke chapter 2 Christmas story is probably the most famous. Uh, It's more than likely that he went to John's house where Mary was and got the account of that. Luke says that he investigated all of the claims about the gospel, and that's what makes it so reliable to me. It's not just this guy that hung out with Jesus and befriended Jesus and followed Jesus and you know had such a great love for Jesus the man. Luke actually investigated all the claims that he had heard. And then he writes a most spectacular, detailed account of the life of Jesus Christ. Luke did not only write the book of Luke. Uh, This may be surprising to a lot of you, but Luke wrote the book of Acts. Uh, Everything we have about the first century church, the account of the first century church, uh, after Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection, and then ascension, uh, Luke wrote that in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, Many people confuse, confusingly think that Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Paul did not write the majority of the New Testament. It, that, that honor actually goes uh, to the physician Luke. Luke almost wrote 28% of the New Testament. He wrote the book of Luke, obviously, 
uh, but lesser known, he wrote the book of the Acts. Uh, some people believe, and uh, it's not really disputed, that Luke may have been a Gentile. If that is the case, and if that were the case, then he is the first and only Gentile, uh, the per a person outside of the Jewish faith, to write in the New Testament or Scripture as a whole, really. Uh, and he writes both the book of Luke and the book of Acts to a man named Theophilus. So he's writing, it would be a Gentile writing to a Gentile saying, listen, uh, this, this Jewish man was the son of God. And, it, and to me, when I read his writings, it sounds like he's writing back to Theophilus, like Theophilus is this Gentile uh, who has studied and learned and possibly even become a Christ follower. And most excellent Theophilus is how he, uh, how he greets this man, this young man. And, he's, and he starts giving this account. It's almost like Luke was sent to gather that information. And, and the Theophilus, here's my report. Here's what I've seen. I've, I've, I've gathered the information. I've examined the evidence. And he even says it. So we're going to jump right into it. Uh, there's so much more about Luke uh, that I want to say. Uh, but we can, we can, we'll get to that. He was a companion of Paul for sure. And uh, here we go. I hope this uh, historical information, he's, he's widely regarded as the first uh, uh, New Testament biblical historian. That would be Luke. Hit record, hit my timer, and here we go, back into the Gospels. Please invite your friends, share this out. Luke chapter 1. Verse 1, so many others have tried their hand at putting together a story of the wonderful harvest of scripture and history that took place among us, using reports handed down by the original eyewitnesses who served this word with their very lives. Since I have investigated all the reports in close detail, starting from the story's beginning I decided to write it all out for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt the reliability of what you were taught. A childless couple conceived. Luke chapter 1 verse 5. During the rule of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest assigned service in the regiment of Abijah. His name was Zechariah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Together they lived honorably before God, carefully in keeping to the ways and the commandments, enjoying a clear conscience before God. But they were childless, because Elizabeth could not conceive, and now they were quite old. It so happened that as Zechariah was carrying out his priestly duties before God, working the shift assigned to his regiment, it came his one turn in life to enter the sanctuary of God and burn incense. The congregation was gathering outside and praying in the temple at the hour of the incense offering. Unannounced, an angel of God appeared just to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was paralyzed in fear. But the angel reassured him, don't fear, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Elizabeth, your wife, will bear a son by you. You are to name him John. You're going to leap like a gazelle for joy, and not only you, many will be delighted at his birth. He'll achieve great stature with God. He'll drink neither wine nor beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit from the moment he leaves his mother's womb. He will turn many sons and daughters of Israel back to their God. He will herald God's arrival in the style and the strength of Elijah, soften the hearts of the parents to the children, and kindle devout understanding among the hardened skeptics. He'll get the people ready for God. Zechariah said to the angel, Do you expect me to believe this? I am an old man and my wife is an old woman. But the angel said, I am Gabriel. The sentinel of God sent especially to you with this glad news. 
but because you have not believed me, you'll be unable to say a word until the day of your son's birth. Every word I have spoken, every word I have spoken to you will come true on time, God's time. Meanwhile, the congregation waiting for Zechariah was getting restless, wondering what was keeping him so long in the sanctuary. When he came out and couldn't speak, they knew he had seen the vision. He continued speechless and had to use sign language with the people. When the course of his priestly assignment was completed, he went back home. It wasn't long before his wife Elizabeth conceived. She went off by herself for five months, relishing her pregnancy. So this is how God acts to remedy my unfortunate condition, she said. A virgin conceives. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant from David. The virgin's name was Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will rule Jacob's house forever, no end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, but how? I've never slept with a man. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child that you bring birth to will be called holy and son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is? Everyone called her barren, and here she is six months pregnant. Nothing, you see, is impossible with God. And Mary said, yes, I see it all now. I'm the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me just as you say. Then the angel left her, blessed among women. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. Mary didn't waste a minute. She got up and traveled to the town in Judea in the hill country, straight to Zachariah's house, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaped. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and sang out exuberantly, You're so blessed among women, and the babe in your womb also blessed. And, and why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord would visit me? The moment the sound of your greeting entered my ears, the babe in my womb leapt like a lamb for sheer joy. Blessed woman who believed what God said, believed every word would come true. And Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one look at me, and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God, whose very name is holy, set apart from all the others. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength and scattered the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses and pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down at a banquet. The calloused rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised, beginning with Abraham and right up to now. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months and then went back to her own home. The birth of John, Luke chapter 1, verse 57. When Elizabeth was full term in her pregnancy, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives, seeing that God had overwhelmed her with mercy, celebrated with her. 
On the eighth day, they came to the circumcision of the child and were calling him Zechariah after his father. But his mother intervened, no, no, he is to be called John. But they said, no one in your family is named that. They used sign language to ask Zechariah what he wanted to name the son. Asking for a tablet, Zechariah wrote his name. His name is to be John. That took everyone by surprise. Surprise followed surprise. Zechariah's mouth was now open and his tongue was loose and he was talking and praising God. A deep reverential fear settled over the neighborhood. And in all that Judean hill country, the people talked about nothing else. Everyone who heard about it took it to heart wondering, what will become of this child? Clearly, God has his hand in this. Then Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He came and he set his people free. He set the power of salvation in the center of our lives and in the very house of David, his servant, just as he promised long ago. Through the preaching of his holy prophets, deliverance from our enemies in every hateful hand, mercy to our fathers as he remembers to do what he said he would do. What he swore to our father Abraham, a clean rescue from the enemy camp so we can worship him without a care in the world, made holy before him as long as we live. And you, my child, prophet of the highest, you will go ahead of the master to prepare his ways Present the offer of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of their sins through the heartfelt mercies of our God. God's sunrise will break upon us, shining on those in the darkness, those sitting in the shadow of death, then showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the pathway of peace. The child grew up healthy and spirited. He lived out in the desert until the day he made his prophetic debut in Israel. The birth of Jesus, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went up from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him on the manger because there was no room in the hotel. An event for everyone. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly God's angels stood among them and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, do not be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town. A Savior who is the Messiah and Master. This is what you're looking for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and peace to all women on earth who please him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's go to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child, and all who heard the shepherds were impressed. Mary kept all of these things to herself, holding them dear 
and deep within herself. The shepherds returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they'd seen and heard. It turned out exactly as they had been told. I want you to, um, I want you to notice the painstaking detail that sets Luke apart from Matthew or Mark or John or Peter or Paul or the author of Hebrews or James. This man, more than likely, was a Gentile outsider physician who appears to me, in my opinion, to have been sent uh, to investigate the claims, to investigate what had been told, what had been heard, and, and, and to find out it was a fact, sort of a fact search that he was on. And he writes it so detailed. It wasn't a once upon a time story for Luke. It wasn't in a land far, far away. It was, I'm going to John, I'm going to Mary, I'm going to the eyewitnesses who saw this thing happen. I'm going to investigate all of the claims of healings and the resurrection. I'm going to investigate the claims of water turning to wine, the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to investigate the claims of the disciples who were with him and then who were not with him and then who were back with him and then the, the claims that the fear that was upon them that they too would be crucified and the claims that after the resurrection, that fear turned into emboldened, empowered, courageous testimony uh, that they were now willing to be set on fire, hung upside down, boiled in vats of oil uh, to claim that Jesus was the Son of God in a world that did not uh, appreciate that and in a religion that thought it was blasphemous and now empowered by the Roman Empire uh, with the tool of crucifixion, surely these followers of the way would be stomped out. The Apostle Luke, I'm telling you this right now. As a child, I, I grew up in the faith of my family, my grandmother, my mom, my dad, the church I grew up in, uh, the Baptist denomination, my faith was uh, a hand-me-down faith in many, many ways. The Apostle Luke is why I'm not merely a Christian, but a follower of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Luke is why I do what I do. The Apostle Luke solidifies for me the historical accuracy of the biblical faith claim that Jesus is the Son of God. It's, it's, not, it's not even, it's not hope so. It is the evidence that is presented to me, that is presented to the world, that finds Jesus guilty as charged. He is the Son of God. Lord, I pray blessing on every person listening, every person watching. Bring us back tomorrow as we continue to listen to this account of Luke in a different way and compare it to the others. And while they are synoptically, uh, chronologically uh, told, Luke's version is crisp, clear, precise, educated, and seemingly from an outsider looking in. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. I'll see you back tomorrow. Hey, please share this out and write, um, something about Luke uh, so that people will be hooked to watch it. A lot of people who missed the first of this broadcast have no idea who Luke is. And if they don't know who Luke is, they won't understand this like they could. So if you didn't watch the beginning of this particular episode, you need to. Bye, everybody.